So let's go ahead and open in prayer, and then we'll get to our topic. Gracious Lord God, we thank you and we praise you, we love you, and uh, just thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for Jesus, most of all. For everyone who's here, and we do pray, for, Lord, for those who could not make it for whatever reason, we do pray for help for them, and uh, that you'd continue to work in our lives, that you teach us today, help us to understand some principles for interpreting prophetic literature, that we may honor you and know you more and more every day, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, uh, welcome to the Open Bible Studio Electives. Uh, for those who don't know, my name is Michael Weiss. I am a uh, videographer, photographer, editor, and social media manager here at Zion's Hope. And we are on YouTube, we're on Facebook, on Twitter. So if you're on social media, check us out. We have over 160 videos, I think now, on our YouTube channel. A variety of things, you know, from promotions for events coming up, cruises and trips, to the studio electives and much, much more. So if you're able to check that out, I would encourage you to do so and, and, and share them too. Share all that information because that would help us out a little bit there. Well, we're doing a series on hermeneutics or basic Bible interpretation. Uh, so far, we've covered some principles for interpreting historic narrative, wisdom literature, and poetry. Today, we're actually going to look at a, a different topic, interpreting prophetic literature in Scripture. Some things, of course, you probably already know, but as always, context and grammar are always the foundation for studying any kind of biblical text or any kind of literature in Scripture. But first, we need to define what prophecy is. We have to define our terms. That's extremely, extremely important. Now, when I say prophecy, what do you guys usually think of? The future, and what else? Telling the future. That's usually what we think of. Usually when somebody does mention prophecy, that's what comes into our mind, the future. But there really is much more to prophecy than just that. A vision. A vision, yep, that can be a two. Uh, the Hebrew word for prophecy is naba, naba. And it is based from the word nabi, which means prophet. So a prophet has a prophecy. Kind of convenient. Uh, God gave his message to individuals who in turn would proclaim that message to the people. That's what a prophet was to do. Now, this actually did take two forms, took two forms. The first one is forthtelling, forthtelling. That is just proclaiming God's message. This is what the Lord says, or thus saith the Lord. God has a message for you, Israel, you, Judah, you kings, you Gentile nations. God has something he wants to say to you, and you better listen up. Then the second is foretelling, foretelling. That basically is proclaiming history before it happens. That's what prophecy is when it comes to future events. Proclaiming history before it happens. Now, biblically, the focus was on the first, foretelling, not the second, not the second. We do make a mistake if we always focus on the second. Now, it's part of Scripture, we understand that, and about one-third of the Bible is prophecy in some way, shape, or form. But we do need to keep these things in mind when we study prophetic texts. So now we come to prophecy in the Bible. Prophecy in the Bible. Now, I've got a question for you. Where is the first example of a prophet in the Bible, and what is the text? Let's see, there's a little Bible trivia here. See if anybody knows. I'll give you a hint, it happened after creation. <laughs> Let me help you. Moses and Aaron in Exodus chapter 7. It's the first time. Let's look at Exodus 7, 1 and 2. Now, of course, we know that uh, God you know, rescued the children of Israel out of Egypt. They've been in slavery for many, many years. And God sent Moses to free them. And Moses is like, oh, I can't go. No, I can't do that. You've got to send somebody else. Chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your what? Prophet. Prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. So Aaron was the spokesperson in one sense for Moses who was going to give Aaron the words. So a prophet is someone who got the words from God to tell to someone else. Now, while there were prophets in the Old Testament, like Abraham is called a prophet, David is called a prophet. The office of the prophet began with Elijah in the 9th century or 800 BC. Once again, prophets were messengers from God 
who proclaimed God's message to the people in the culture in which they lived. It's very important to understand that. I, I call them covenant reminders and covenant enforcers to Israel. I like that phrase, covenant enforcers. I think that's pretty cool. And we'll see why here in just a minute. They called the people to remember the Lord, to come back to Him, to come back to His covenant with them, or face judgment for breaking the covenant. Now, in our English Bibles, we have four major and 12 minor prophets. These are also known, by the way, as writing prophets. The major prophets are Isaiah through Daniel, minor prophets Hosea through Malachi, not because they're more important than the other or anything like that, just because of the length of their written prophecy. The timing of their prophecy was roughly about 850 B.C. to around 400 B.C. So we're talking about 450 years. Now, it's not right after another. Sometimes there was overlap. Sometimes there was a, you know, a time gap in between there when God sent a prophet. You know, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel. Now, Daniel is technically an apocalyptic book. We'll talk a little bit more about that, Lord willing, in the future. And that's important also to understand, but we'll see some of the principles do overlap when it comes to apocalyptic literature. So is everybody with me so far? Just want to kind of give you a little bit of a background of the prophets and prophecy. Now we come to interpreting prophetic literature. Now we're going to spend a lot of time here. So dig in and let's get ready to rock and roll. Now, within prophetic literature, there is disaster, there's salvation, there's woes. You know, woe to you, woe to you, woe to you. Pronouncement of judgment. And there are other forms of prophetic literature. But I just want to give you some general principles. First, understand the covenant background of prophetic literature. This is something we miss a lot of times. Remember, God freed the Hebrews from Egyptian slavery, brought them to Mount Sinai, where He gave them His law, the Mosaic Covenant, which was known as a suzerain vassal treaty. Who, how, how many of you have ever heard that phrase before? If you haven't, that's okay. If you haven't, just a few of you. Now, this was a common phrase in the ancient world. This was a superior making a covenant with an inferior, basically. I have done this, therefore I want you to do this. That's the idea. This is very common in the ancient world. Let me give you kind of an overview here. First of all, there was a preamble. A preamble. This is where the superior party talked about uh, the originator. This is who I am. This is who I am. The second part is a review of what this authority figure did. And we'll see how this connects also to the scriptures in just a moment. And this reminds the subordinate group of the faithfulness of the one who is in authority. This individual or this group or this king did something. I'm supposed to do this? Well, I need to do it because they've been faithful. That's the idea. Third, there were some expectations. There were some things that this subordinate group was to do and some things not to do. Fourth, there was a public reading. So that way all of the people could hear it. Then there was a list of witnesses, a witness is given. And last was a list of blessings for following the covenant and then curses for disobedience to the covenant. So it's very important to understand this background when you look at Scripture. And, and I want to remind you, covenants were cut. They were made in blood. That's the foundation actually for the, for the word for covenant. You cut a covenant. Now, in Exodus 20... God tells them who he was and what he did in verses 1 and 2. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt. There's the preamble. That's the, he's the originator of this covenant. There's a review of what he did. Therefore, I want you to do this and this and this and this. So if you have your Bibles or your phones, and I have it up here on the screen, click or turn to Exodus 24. I just want to show you a couple things here. Because in Exodus 24... We have the nation of Israel agreeing to follow the Mosaic Covenant. Agreeing to follow the Mosaic Covenant. So we're going to read verses 3 through 8 here in Exodus 24. Then Moses came and recounted, there's the public reading, to all the people, all the words of the Lord and all the ordinances. Here's what you do. Here's what you don't do. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words which the Lord has spoken, we will do. Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. Then he arose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. There's the witnesses right there. 
He sent young men of the sons of Israel, and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed many bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Now, sometimes this covenant would include a meal, and that's part of what this is about here. Moses took half of the blood and put it on the basins. The other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it, there it is again, in the hearing of the people, and they said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people. Remember, he's, he's got the hyssop thing and they're sprinkling the blood on them. And said, Behold the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. It's very important to understand this when it comes to this topic. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Did Israel keep their promise? No. No. Sadly, the nation broke God's law or covenant continuously, even as it was being made, that golden calf incident. You know, remember that? And what was the result? Throughout Israel's history, God sent prophets to them, to the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Remember, it split after Solomon died. And he says, you guys are disobeying the covenant that you promised you'd fulfill. Come back to the Lord. Come back and obey what God has said. You promised you would do it. Now you're being held to account for your promise. The primary purpose of the prophets was to call the nation back to covenant faithfulness and a right relationship with their God. That's what their primary purpose was. No matter what they did, no matter what they said, no matter where they went, whether they were in Babylon or in Israel, that was their primary purpose. So, remember the covenant background. Second, second, look at the historical and political context of each prophet. Because remember, there's a 450 year period that's taking place here. Some prophesied before the Babylonian exile, some during, some after, and some multiple times. Example is Isaiah, about 700 BC. He prophesied about and saw the Assyrian invasion of the northern kingdom. But he also prophesied about the Babylonian invasion, which took place 100 years after he was alive. And one of the reasons someone knew there was a prophet in Israel was because his prophecy came to pass. That was one of the tests of a prophet. And often prophets talked about leaders in Israel and Judah, talked about the kings or the rulers of Gentile nations as well, which sets up the context. Very important, again, for us to understand that. This sets the political background, the religious background. And by the way, uh, David Ettinger did a great series overview on the minor prophets. Most of that is up on YouTube right now. You can check that out. The other ones are coming as quickly as I can edit them. Uh, so check those out, and that will help you as you study the prophets. This is where you can ask some questions when you're studying. Okay, so who was the prophet prophesying to? Were they talking to Israel? Remember, that was a northern kingdom. Or Judah, the southern kingdom. Or a Gentile nation. Who are they talking to? Egypt? Babylon? Who are they talking to? What is the prophet actually saying? What is he prophesying? What is he proclaiming? Is he warning judgment? Is he speaking of future blessing? Because they did both. If it's recorded, what was the response of the people? Did they say, oh yes, you're absolutely right. We repent. Not usually. <laughs> they kept going the same way, unfortunately. I'll give you an example. If it's recorded, by the way. Jonah proclaimed judgment to Nineveh. Did they repent? Yeah, yeah. But about 100 years later, God did judge them as recorded in the book of Nahum. So again, that prophecy did come true. It just was delayed because of their repentance. So you have to understand some of those contexts. Third, prophecy was given to the people for the present and future from which the prophets prophesied. I know it's kind of obvious, but it's important to mention. The messages were for those who listened to them at that time and for future generations primarily in Israel. Again, they said, thus saith the Lord. Well, anybody can say that, right? That's why there were certain tests for a prophet. That's another topic. Or this is what the Lord says. And the present message was usually what? Repent or be judged. Repent or be judged. And the last prophet of the Old Testament, John the Baptist, had the same message. Repent or be judged. The future message was judgment, but also hope. 
the restoration of Israel, coming back to the land, and much, much more. The blessing of God on His covenant people. It's also important to remember when the <coughs> prophets prophesied their message, they never did it for sensationalism. They never did it to fulfill idle curiosity. These individuals were called by God with a message from Him to the people. And as Jeremiah said, woe to me if I don't prophesy, <laughs> if I don't fulfill what God has called me to do. It's very important, particularly in our day and age. So that's third. Fourth, as with historic narrative, be aware that in a few chapters or verses or even in the same verse, there can be an immediate message and a future message. Let me give you an example here. Very familiar text, read, it, read almost every Christmas time, and rightly so. Isaiah 9, 6. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. What a wonderful description of Jesus, by the way. But in this one verse, please note, we have the first and second coming of Christ. The first part is Christ's first coming. The eternal Son took upon human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. But then we have this thing about the government being on his shoulder. Well, that hasn't happened yet. That's the second part. That's his second coming. And verse 7 actually talks about his kingdom, which again has not arrived yet. And whatever your view is, it has not fully arrived yet or has not arrived yet. He, but he still is the counseling wonder. We look to him for guidance. We look to him for wisdom. We look to his word. He is mighty God. He is God himself. Father of eternity, Sar, or not Sar Shalom, that's Prince of Peace. The one who controls history, Prince of Peace against our Shalom. In him we have peace with God. But he's still not ruling from his throne in Jerusalem yet. He will one day when he returns. So that's fourth. So keep that in mind because it can be very confusing. As we saw in Jeremiah, we saw in Daniel, <laughs> things can be overlapping, they can be connected, and we'll look at a few other things here in just a moment. And this brings me actually to fifth. Remember there's both a literal, to, literal and figurative language used in the prophets and for prophecy. Now it can be difficult to distinguish this sometimes. But unless there is a reason to accept a text as figurative, it should be taken at face value or literally. Okay? If God says, well, I'm going to restore Israel and Judah to the land, there's no reason to say that's the church. There is no reason whatsoever. That's replacement theology and it is error. Another example, though, Joel 2.31, very familiar to us. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. Extremely important verse, by the way, when it comes to end times. But also, too, if we look at this, now the sun can be darkened through different means. But the moon turning into blood, is it going to turn into literal blood? I mean, all of a sudden, is it, we can look at the moon, it's going to be blood? No. We obviously can see this is figurative language figurative language about cosmic disturbances, by the way. And this is also important in apocalyptic literature. It's even used more in apocalyptic literature, Revelation, Daniel, and more. Also, when it comes to this, remember there are many symbols used in the Bible when it comes to prophetic literature. This means there are people, places, objects, and more that do stand for something else. And again, this is also connected to apocalyptic literature, but I, I want to mention this. Give you an example here. Uh, in referring to two witnesses at the end of the age, Revelation 11, 7 through 8 says this. When they, the two witnesses, have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them. Well, who's the beast? Antichrist. Will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. Their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is mystically or spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. So what city is this talking about? Jerusalem. In this context, is talking about Jerusalem. Very important to understand that. Now, when it does come to this, please do remember that symbols change. Sometimes they can be used for one thing. Sometimes they can be the same, but sometimes they can be different. So be aware of that as you study. Well, it's good to look at the first mention, Remember, always look at the context first, 
Because symbols can mean certain different things in certain contexts. And just because symbolism is used in one place for one thing doesn't mean it's going to always be the same. Just keep that in mind. Sixth, when it comes to prophecies given at the time of the prophet, there are what are sometimes called near-far prophecies, pattern fulfillment or multiple fulfillment. Mike mentioned this just a little while ago. We talk about, or rather he talked about the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Potentially mentioned there in part in Daniel, but also too, Jesus talks about it. But then Revelation also talks about it, and there's also still a future fulfillment of that too. So we have multiple fulfillments of that. Very important when it comes to this. This near fulfillment refers to something that occurred near the time the prophecy was spoken. Now it could be two years, it could be a few months, it could be 10 or 15 years. It just depends. But there is a far fulfillment also of many years or even centuries of a gap between them after that initial fulfillment. And by the way, there can be more than two. You know, we tend to think, <coughs> well, something's fulfilled, it's never going to happen again. That's not the way Jewish thought works. It can happen over and over and over and over again. That's why I use the phrase pattern fulfillment. There can be multiple prophecy uh, fulfillments and of a special date. Let me give you an example here. You may or may not know this. The ninth of Av, or Tish Av. Now there is some debate even in Jewish scholarly circles about Solomon's and the second temple when it was destroyed, but they've come to the consensus that it was on the ninth of Av. Both, 586 BC, Solomon's temple was destroyed. Then in 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem and Herod's temple, or the second temple. Then in 1290, the edict of King Edward compelling Jews to leave England was signed. Then the Jews were expelled from Spain in 1492 on the 9th of Av. Then World War I broke out in 1914 on the 9th of Av. And there's more even into this 21st century, by the way, too. You say, wow, that's really interesting. Well, here's the thing. The Jewish rabbinic teachers or sages of the of, of before time, view the ninth of Av as preordained as a day of tragedy. Why? Traditionally, this was the day the spies came back in fear from the promised land and gave a negative report to the people and their hearts melted. So in their mind, that's in Numbers 13 and 14, by the way, in their mind, God put this in place as a day of tragedy for the Jewish people. And that has been shown to be true down through history. Now when it comes to prophecy, let's look at Ezekiel chapter 11. A little bit of extensive here, so if you want to again turn there, click there, but I do have the text up here just in case you, you want to look at it up here. Ezekiel 11, 14 through 20. Now we won't go over all of this, but I just want to show you here. Then the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel saying, Son of man, your brothers, your relatives, your fellow exiles, and the whole house of Israel, all of them, are those to whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Go far from the Lord, this land has been given us as a possession. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, Though I have removed them from far away among the nations, and though I had scattered them among the countries, remember, he's in Babylonian exile right here, yet I was a sanctuary for them a little while in the countries where they had gone. That should be very comforting, by the way, for them, and for us too. Therefore, Say, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you out of the countries among which you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. Wow. Talk about an important text. When they come there, they will remove all its detestable things and its abominations from it. And I will give them one heart and put a new spirit within them. And I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. That's the covenant right there. Then they will be my people and I shall be their God. Wow, what a powerful, powerful, wonderful text here. But there was a near fulfillment at the return of Israel following the Babylonian captivity. Remember, that lasted 70 years. But this was also a prophecy, like Jeremiah 31, 31, about the new covenant made with Israel with a far fulfillment, and most of which has yet to come to full fruition. But Paul also mentions this in 2 Corinthians 6, 16, where he actually talks about the Corinthian assembly who had 
quite a few problems, <laughs> to say the least. They're, they're dealing with the sin of idolatry and, um, and more, by the way. And he says, for you or we are the temple of the living God. And he cites this passage, or part of this passage here. But again, there is still a future aspect to this as stated in Revelation 21, 3 and 7 and many other passages too. So while there was an immediate fulfillment from Ezekiel's time for the captives when they came back from Babylonian captivity, there were still future fulfillments too. And there will be another fulfillment at the end of the age when Christ brings all the Jews back to himself and to the land. And Paul applied this to the followers of Christ where God dwells in us and among us as the body of Christ, for we are the temple of God. So, just to reiterate, it's not done yet. At the end of time, as we know it, God will bring back the Jews from all the nations before the return of Christ, and He will dwell with His people in the new heavens and the new earth. So we see multiple fulfillments of this one prophecy. Another quick example. Isaiah 6, 9 through 13, Isaiah 10, 20 through 25, Isaiah 11, 11 through 16, compared with Zechariah 13, 7 through 9 and Romans 11, we see something very similar. This is about the remnant, the remnant that returned after captivity, but also there will be a remnant purged by God at the end of the age known as, quote, all Israel, which David Ettinger has, has talked about and is also in our magazine. This remnant or all Israel at that time will be saved after they survive Antichrist and Satan's wrath. So there's another fulfillment when God brings them to himself. So this is where it's important to understand these aspects when we're studying prophetic texts. So just those, those six principles. A few other things to keep in mind. As I mentioned, the prophets were covenant reminders and covenant enforcers. Now I say that because that's what they did. They reminded the nation about their commitment to the Lord. You guys said you would do this. You committed to follow the Lord. The true and living God is your God, but you didn't do it. You followed after pagan gods. You followed after other nations, trusting them rather than in Him. You trusted in your horses, in your military, more than you trusted in Yahweh. And they reminded of the nation of those things. They said, you know what? If you guys continue to disobey, you're going to get judged. Read Deuteronomy 28, blessings and cursings. One of those cursings was to get kicked out of the land and to be subjective to a nation whose language you do not understand. Enter Babylon, Medo-Persia, Rome, Greece, etc., etc. And sometimes in the prophets we see a God using a courtroom setting to call Israel or another nation or creation for Israel to call against their accounts. God is a judge. The prophet's kind of like a prosecuting attorney. Let me give you a few examples of this. In Isaiah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we see this very clearly. The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Again, that sets the context of when he prophesied. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up. Who's the sons? Israel. But they have revolted against me. So he's calling creation as witnesses against the nation of Israel. We see it again in Micah, chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Hear now what the Lord is saying. Arise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. He's talking to Israel here. Listen, you mountains, to the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth. There's parallelism there. Because the Lord has a case against his people. Even with Israel, he will dispute. So they're acting like a prosecuting attorney where God is the judge and saying, okay, Israel, make your case. Here's creation. Here's God. Here am I. Go ahead. Try to justify your actions. Try to claim your innocence, even though God knows you're guilty. What was the purpose? Repent. 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 Sadly, most of the time they didn't. That was a solution to avoid being judged. So he would use creation. Sometimes he'd actually call Israel against other nations. I mean, he's using this in a different way. Now, very quickly, prophetic literature in the New Testament. Now, there are a variety of ways that the New Testament writers quote or refer to prophetic literature in the Old Testament. 
Sometimes the writer will quote or reiterate something to reiterate the same truth. Truth is truth, by the way. No matter who you are, where you live, or when you live, truth does not change. If it does, it's not true. It's opinion. And we live in a world where opinion is looked at as truth, and that's very sad. Paul himself quotes Habakkuk 2.4, the just shall live by faith, in Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11. Again, saying the same truth that the just shall live by faith. Acts 15, James quotes Amos 9, 11, and 12 about salvation coming to the Gentiles. So there are times where it's used kind of in an expositional way, but there are other times that the prophecies are quoted as a springboard or application for something different. It just depends upon the context. So we do need to keep that in mind whenever it comes to this. So our idea of only exposition, although it should be primary, is not the only way that the New Testament writers will quote the Old Testament prophecies. Of course, all led by the Holy Spirit. We understand that too. It's Scripture. It's Scripture. And there is, of course, prophecy in the New Testament too. We don't want to neglect that. Thessalonians talks about that. Revelation, of course, talks about that. But there is also the proclamation about Christ and what to do in response. That's the, what the apostles proclaimed. And they were prophets in their proclamation. Jesus has come. Turn to Him. Repent. Turn to Him. Put your faith in Him. And Paul proclaimed it too. But there's also a proclamation about future events. Of course, the Antichrist, the end of the age, the rapture, things like that. But we need to keep in mind, before God's book was completed, there were individuals in the first century who were called prophets. Paul was a prophet. Peter was a prophet. Agabus and others were prophets and prophetesses too. Why? Because God's word wasn't finished yet. And guess what? Most of the assemblies would not have a copy of Scripture. We ha I mentioned this before, but we have to keep that in mind. So when God gave a, a message to someone for that particular group or congregation, they were, of course, to test it with what Scripture had already said. But, you know, this ch church, you know, 100 miles away, you know, they wouldn't have maybe Matthew or Luke, so somebody would take that and read it to them, or God would give someone to that individual or group to proclaim a message. But, of course, then God's Word is complete. God's Word is complete now. What do we do, and how do we deal with applying prophetic literature to our world, to our culture, to our lives today? First things first, be very careful about over-spiritualizing, about hype and sensationalism that's very common among Bible prophecy teachers and ministries today. Be very careful. I'm very thankful Zion's Hope does not do that, by the way. Many will talk about, oh, blood moons, blood moons. Guess what? They happen all the time. It just depends upon where you live. It may be in one nation, but you don't see it over across the world. It may be over in Africa, but we don't see it in America. It may be in America, but guess what? They don't see it in Israel. We have to be very careful about these kinds of things. To say, well, oh, oh, this has got to be the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast, the mark of the beast. It's not going to happen until Daniel's 70th week. Now, there may be things that will lead up to that, and the technology may be there, but that will not be instituted until that time. But people talk about this all the time, or they set dates. 88 reasons the rapture has to happen in 1988. Guess what? It didn't happen. He said, well, it was 89. It didn't happen. And the sad thing is, people will say, well, this is the sign of the end, whatever this is. It could be any number of things. Go to Scripture. Don't be deceived. This hype and this misinterpretation and this misrepresentation also of prophetic literature is very dangerous, and it makes Christians look like fools. If you've studied prophecy for any amount of time, this has happened over and over and over again in the body of Christ. And it's very sad because you know what? It's an offense to God when it comes down to it. And we're making his text say something it doesn't say. Now, while there are spiritual truths in Scripture and in prophetic literature, please be careful about over-spiritualizing the text. Be very careful. Sodom and Gomorrah is not talking about New York and Los Angeles. Okay, it's not a prophecy against them. You may want it to be, but it's not going to be. So keep that in mind. Second, very important, America and other countries are not covenant nations like Israel. 
God used the prophets to speak to Israel in context, or Judah, historically. Now, with that said, third, while other countries are not covenant nations, there are principles we can and learn, we can and should learn from, from prophetic literature and the prophets. Do we need to be warned of idolatry today? Absolutely. Materialism, money, stuff. Sexuality is becoming the new idol of the world. Do we need to be warned about rejecting God? Absolutely. What about false humility and false worship? Hmm. False teachers and false prophets. Boy, they're rampant, aren't they? Around the world. A false gospel, by the way. Should we not also be warned about the letting of paganism infiltrate the church and our thinking and our actions and our practices? Absolutely. So there is application and principles from prophetic literature that we need to hear today. We must hear today. So important when it comes to this, even as a nation too. Even as a nation too, though America is not a covenant nation or other nations are not covenant nations like Israel. We need to hear what God has to say. We need to hear those warnings. So as we finish up, prophecy is a vital form of literature in Scripture. Again, some estimate about one-third of Scripture is prophetic in some way. And I do hope these principles that you have there are helpful to you. But the question arises all the time when discussing this topic. Are there prophets today like those in biblical times? The answer is no. No. Now, God may give insight to someone, but God's revelation is complete. There is no new revelation, and we have to be very careful. And those who claim to be prophets are in individuals who claim to be apostles and all this other stuff are individuals to avoid. I have seen some. I have met some. They're not individuals to listen to. Now, there is the gift of prophecy. We have to define that. This is one who faithfully proclaims God's word, calling people to be faithful to the Lord, which is what the prophets did, warning of the consequences for turning away from him and equipping the body of Christ for service. That is a gift of prophecy today. Beware false prophets who prophesy their own false ideas, and in some cases, demonically inspired ideas. Be very careful. Now, in the future, there will be two prophets who do arise. We are aware of that. The two witnesses of Revelation talked about that. And they will do miracles and they'll proclaim God's word. And of course, at that certain time, they'll be killed. But I will say this in closing. While there are no prophets today like there were in Scripture, we need those who truly have the gift of prophecy to speak out today. We need to hear what God's word says. We need to proclaim what God's word says to the body of Christ starting at first. But we also need these individuals to proclaim God's word to the culture and to warn of what is going to happen as we continue to turn away and celebrate a culture of death. That is what is happening around the world and in America today. Why? Because we're not listening to what God has said. And we need individuals now more than ever to proclaim His truth to a pagan world and an ever more pagan church. Hear what he has said. Follow him because guess what? It is going to get tough. Whatever your view of end times is, it is going to get hard before Christ returns. There will be persecution. There will be difficulty. We will lose things and we may even lose our lives. And we need individuals today to stand up and say, this is what God has said from his word. And you know what? We need to listen Amen. and follow through. Amen. Amen. <laughs> With that said, let's pray. Gracious Lord God, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, for the prophets of old. And we forget that many of them suffered greatly because of their message, because people didn't want to listen then and people do not want to listen today. So, Lord, as we look at prophetic literature, give us wisdom and understanding about how to properly apply it, but also study it and understand the foundation for your truth. And while we may not be able to do this all of the time, doing look at these, you know, the, the context and the, the background and all these things, we know that your word is true. So speak to us now through your word, through your truth, and change our lives. Change us. 
Help us to follow you faithfully no matter what the cost is, no matter what other people say or other people think or other people do, whether it's government, whether it's family, whether it's friends. May we trust in you, Lord. And if there is someone here or watching or listening later who does not know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I pray you will work in their lives. Show them their sin. Show them they've, they've, they've fallen short of your glory. And that the only remedy, the only way out, the only solution, the only salvation is in Jesus Christ who died for their sins, physically resurrected three days later, ascended into heaven and will return one day as king and judge. And that by faith in him alone, they can be saved. So Lord, protect your church, protect your people, protect the message. And Lord, all throughout the world where Christians are persecuted, protect your messengers too. And use us as you will where we live today. Even if we don't have the gift of prophecy, Lord, you've called us to proclaim your truth. Let us be faithful in doing that and to do it with a broken heart, to do it in love. And all this we ask for your glory in the mighty, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at one 888 7819466 Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.